Where is that stupid cab? Is that them? God, I hope so. They're already 20 minutes late. It better be them. <sighs> Damn it! Come on, where is this guy? <sighs> That's it. I'm calling them. Company, how may I help you this evening? Yes, uh, hello? It's me, Josh Anderson. We spoke a minute ago. I'm the guy who called for the cab out in Highway 27. Mm. Oh yeah, that's right. I remember you. Did you enjoy your ride? No, I haven't gotten it yet. They were supposed to pick me up at 8, but now it's almost 8.30 and there's still no one here. My apologies, sir. Let me see where your driver is. Huh. It looks like he's still about 45 minutes away. 45 minutes? Are you kidding me? Why is he going to be an hour late? Can't you tell him to hurry up? I'm sorry, sir, but I can't. The pickup address is too remote. It's going to take a while for them to get there. From where? Mexico? They're driving a car. It shouldn't take that long. Sir, I'm going to need you to watch your tone, okay? Shut up! Shut the hell up! Get me my cab now! Damn it! This is why I wish I had my own car. I wouldn't have to deal with this crap. Oh, perfect timing. Yo, what's up, man? What up? Where are you, man? Dude, I'm trying to get there, but the stupid cab company just bailed on me. What? Why are you calling a cab? Just order an Uber or something. I can't, man. You know I can't. I'm way too far in the outskirts. They won't pick me up from here. I tried already. I need someone to come pick me up. <laughs> no can do, my dog. Everyone here is lost, bro. I don't think any of us can drive. Seriously? <sighs> I can't believe I'm gonna miss out on this party, man. This is lame as hell. Hold on a sec, man. Let me show what you're missing out on if you don't get over here. I'm gonna FaceTime you. Yeah, that's just what I want to see. Hey, everybody, look. It's Josh. Say hi to the party, Josh. Hey, Josh. Where are you? You should totally be here. I'm trying. I'm just getting screwed over. Oh, well, I hope you come. I really want you to. Do you want some motivation? Oh, uh, yeah. Give it to me. Josh, if you make it, I'll be waiting for you in the guest bedroom upstairs. So you better hurry up, okay? Oh, you bet I'll be there. And fast. Just wait. I'll make this happen. <laughs> well, good. Don't disappoint me, Josh. Man, she is so hot. I don't care what I have to do. I'm not gonna miss my chance to thunderclap them cheeks. <laughs> Hold on, is that somebody? I guess I'm gonna have to do this the old-fashioned way. There goes nothing. Where you headed, bud? A house party by campus. Like 15 minutes, tops. Alright, get in. Thanks for the ride. I was fresh out of luck back there. No problem. I'm glad I picked you up. It's nice to have a pretty passenger, you know. I used to be handsome like you when I was your age. <laughs> uh, thanks. Of course. Hey, you said you're going to a college party, right? You want to pregame a bit? I got some drink in the cup holder there. Uh, no thanks. I'll be good when I get there. Suit yourself. I've got a good buzz going myself. You think I could go into that party with you? Oh. Well, it's not really my place, so I don't think it would be cool if I invited any strangers. What? We're not strangers! I'm helping you out, goddammit! Do you really think it's fair that I'm giving you a free ride and I don't even get to hang out with you guys? Huh? I, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I didn't, I didn't mean to offend you. I just, it's not my house, not my rules. Sorry. <sighs> Whatever. It's fine. It's my bad, you know. I shouldn't expect a bunch of young college kids to want to hang out with an old geezer like me. Holy crap, dude! Slow down! You're gonna hit something! <laughs> what the hell? Stop the car! My car, my rules. <laughs> That? What was that? You know damn well what that was! That was your fault! It was all your fault! Give me your insurance and tell them it's your fault or I'll kill you right now! Get away from me, you psycho!
Holy crap. This can't be happening. Oh god. No, no, no. Please, no. Where'd you go, you little jailbait? Come on out now. I won't hurt you. As long as you listen to me. Holy crap. <laughs> now you see me, now you don't. Hello! I found you! Ah! Someone help! <laughs> This is something that happened to me close to a decade ago when I was in my mid-twenties. I've had a lot of gigs in different settings during my career as a security guard, but out of all the crazy stuff that's ever happened to me on the job, this is by far the memory that baffles me the most. It was the first and last time I ever worked at a cemetery. In the past, there were some graves at this particular cemetery that had been dug up. So they invested in a basic CCTV setup and somebody in the security booth keeping watch of things 24 seven. I signed on to be the nighttime security guard, the graveyard shift at the graveyard. I knew it might be creepier than my previous gigs. So I did a bit of research about the place online. But the only thing I found aside from the articles about the dug up graves was a review on the cemetery's location pin on Google Maps. It was a one star review that said nothing else but, to whom it may concern, just avoid her. A warning from a former employee. The comment was definitely a little worrisome. I commented on the review and even sent them an email, but there was no response. In a couple days, I got called in for an interview. At the end, I mentioned the comment to my interviewer. He rolled his eyes and confirmed it was from the last person who had the job, but they'd quit without notice unceremoniously. So it was probably just a way to be vindictive. With that said, I took the job and started a few nights later. Unfortunately, within the first week, I found out that the warning was no lie. It started on the third night, and it always happened around 3 in the morning. There would be this very troubled woman who would come up to the entrance booth and ask to see her son. I could tell she was getting on in her years and wasn't all there in the head. But as much as I felt bad for her situation, I couldn't let her in. Nobody was allowed in after the visiting hours and my job was to keep them out. After being denied, she would become distraught and confused as to why she couldn't see her son. But the only thing I could say was to come back in the morning. It seemed like I was dealing with a pretty bad case of dementia, but as time went on, things got worse. By the fourth or fifth time she showed up, I saw her staggering out of the darkness toward the entrance of the cemetery as I got myself ready to deal with her. Hello? May I please see my son? Look ma'am, I'm sorry but I can't let you in. It's the middle of the night, you'll have to come back in the morning. Why? I'm here now! Why can't you just let me see him? He's my son! There aren't any lights in the burial grounds. You could trip and get hurt. I'm already in pain. I just want to see my son. I understand, ma'am, but it's against the law to wander the cemetery after dark. You'd call the police on an old woman? I don't want to, but if I have to, I will. Fine. Have it your way, pig. When she walked away, I sat back and returned to watching the cameras. But not even 30 seconds later, I realized it wasn't over yet. I saw her standing at one of the graves with her back somehow bent over at a 90 degree angle, forming a perfect L shape. I had no idea how she got past me so quickly, or how she could stand like that. I didn't want to escort her out, but I knew it was my job to do so. I exited the booth and walked across the grounds to confront her, but when I got where she was supposed to be, there was no sight of her. I shrugged and figured the problem had taken care of itself, then returned to the booth. Nothing happened the rest of the night. But exactly 24 hours later when she was back, as soon as I saw her approaching, I could tell she was already in tears and about to start shouting, so I kept the window closed. Please let me see my son, I'm begging you! You know you can't do that, ma'am. Ma'am, if you don't contain yourself, I'll be forced to call the cops. When I mentioned law enforcement, she stopped and suddenly backed off and staggered away. 
then, when the coast was clear, I turned my eyes back to the camera feed just to see another impossible sight. She was back at the same grave from the night before, down on her knees, ripping up the grass and digging through the dirt with her bare hands like a completely unhinged lunatic. I immediately rushed out and ran to confront her again, but when I arrived, she was just standing there with her back turned toward me. Ma'am, I'm going to... I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. Mommy, see my son! Suddenly, she lunged at me. I turned around and sprinted away, not even looking back until I got back into the security booth. Once there, I collapsed to my knees in shock. I couldn't believe it. I'd never seen anything like that before. She looked more like a monster wearing human skin than an actual person. Out of fear, I called the police. When they arrived, she was long gone. So all that could be done was a review of the footage. I was shocked by what we found because we found nothing. There was no footage of the woman anywhere in the archive. It was like she was a ghost. The cops were skeptical, but they asked me to show them exactly where I had seen her. So I brought them to the gravestone she kept going to. There was nothing there. But at that moment, I finally read the engraving on the stone. It was the grave of a little boy who'd only lived to be a few years old and next to him was allegedly the grave of his mother. I can tell it was the same person I saw the night before due to the familiar obituary pictures. None of it makes sense, but it also makes perfect sense. The woman truly just wanted to see her son. The next day, I quit without notice. I certainly won't be the one getting in her way. I was a 20 year old woman who loved parties, so needless to say, I'd have the time of my life hanging out with my friends. And when my best friend invited me to her house in California, I ecstatically said yes, prepared my stuff, and went on a trip. But unfortunately, my parents were at work and I didn't have a car. So, since waiting for a bus ride could take grueling hours, I decided to cut corners and hitchhike for a ride. I've done it many times before, so I was experienced and relied on this tactic often for convenience purposes. Two cars passed, and when the third one came around, I put my thumb up and decided to take it, and the vehicle was a decent looking man in the driver's seat, alongside his wife sitting next to him. I felt more comfortable getting a ride from a couple than with anyone else. The man politely asked for my name and where I was headed, and so I disclosed the exact address of my destination. Then, after giving them all the details, the couple glanced at each other and smiled, agreeing to take me there. As we drove alongside the dark asphalt road, the man kept asking me strange personal questions like, So, I guess you don't have a boyfriend? No, I don't. Does that mean you've never done it with a guy before? Like, you're a virgin? Uh, I guess I am. I answered the man just to make things less awkward than they already were. The questions he was asking me were questions I thought he'd never ask in front of his wife. Despite that, I shrugged it off thinking that perhaps he was only trying to make small talk. As we approached a nearby gas station, I asked if I could use the restroom which the couple had no qualms with. While sitting on the toilet, a part of me wanted to just call a cab and abandon the rest of the ride. In the end, I figured I'd continue as my friend's place wasn't too far away. I reluctantly began making my way back to the car. When I got in, I apologized to the couple for taking too long. I felt at ease when the couple gave me no issues upon returning. We proceeded to drive off into the night, and that's when we began entering the not-so-busy highway. A few minutes later, the man abruptly pulled over to the side of the road. He then got out of the vehicle without saying a word. I sat there in silence, thinking he was simply going to check the car's engine. As I was about to ask his wife what was happening, to my surprise, the man aggressively opened my side of the door and started grabbing my shoulder with one hand and pointing a knife towards my neck with the other. 
dare to scream or run away and I'll slit your throat. He whispered in my ear maniacally. I was so frightened that I couldn't move my body. As I whimpered in sheer terror, the man placed a wooden locksmith box on my head, preventing me from seeing anything or hollering out loud. I was then handcuffed and held in place by either the man or his wife as the car proceeded to accelerate down the highway. And from that moment, the first disturbing chapter of my life would manifest. I didn't know where I was, but eventually, the car stopped, and it seemed like I was being taken into a house where I was held captive. I was then led blindly to walk down into a basement, where they chained me up, and from that point on, my life would be a living hell. The couple would coerce me to cook and clean for them, and when it was time to eat, the man would chain me up again in the basement, where he fed me scraps, treating me like a rabid animal. I was famished. My loss of motivation and lack of pertinent nutrients often left me disoriented. As a result, my vision would go hazy, and as the couple approached me, I no longer saw them as human beings, but as monsters with distorted faces, bulging eyes and sharp teeth. To make matters worse, the couple had the habit of placing me inside a box that resembled a coffin underneath their bed every night. Having my head locked in a box or chained up in the basement didn't make any difference. I was kidnapped to be a slave in a house far away from home. I struggled to keep my composure, desperately persuading myself that this was nothing but a horrible nightmare. However, one afternoon, as I was cleaning every corner of this tiny shelter, I noticed the creep entering the bathroom while his wife was watching TV. That was my window of opportunity, a once in a lifetime opening where I could be free again. So, without a second thought, I ran for it, using up all of my strength as I dashed toward the back door, making my way outside. Help! Help! Somebody help me! As the wind brushed my face, I had a tinge of hope. I felt as though I could make it. <laughs> But it was only a matter of time before one of them got to me, and it just so happened to be the wife. She was able to catch up to me and pin me down on the ground before the husband came to her aid. Crying rivers of tears, I was brought back into that hellhole where the couple locked me up in a box underneath their bed for much longer. Again, it was dark and cramped, making it hard for me to breathe. So, as the couple laughed and cuddled on the bed, I suffered from immense anxiety, having convinced myself that there was no one who would ever find me and that I would die here. This went on for several years until, one day, the creep went out to buy some groceries, leaving his wife and me alone to chat. I tried to understand why they were doing this to me. After constantly prodding, I was able to discover that she was also a victim like me, and that she didn't have a choice but to play along with her husband to survive. Hey, we can't stay here. We have to leave now while we still can. I said. She looked around the house, a bit hesitant at first, but after several tense minutes, she finally agreed to escape with me. Moments later, we reported the man to the cops at a nearby gas station. The cops later arrived at the shelter, arresting the dumbfounded creep. I was fortunate to be alive, but since then, I have had a hard time sleeping on a regular bed, finding myself inside a dark wooden box to sleep in until further notice. This story was inspired by a tragic incident that happened on May 19th of 1997. A woman named Colleen Stain was hitchhiking to go to a friend's birthday party when a man named Cameron Hooker and his wife Janice picked Colleen up, only to kidnap her and hold her captive for the next seven years of her life. The animation pretty much sums up the ordeal in a nutshell on what her life was like in captivity. Here's an image of the locksmith box used on Colleen's head when the kidnapping took place. But the most chilling image of all is the infamous box Colleen slept in. Here's what it looked like. In one of Colleen's testimonies, it was said that she would often imagine she was in some kind of adventure when locked up in the box, which was one of the only ways to keep her sanity at those times. My first job out of high school was the night shift at a 7-Eleven on the outskirts of town. 
For the most part, it was the most boring job imaginable, and I'm pretty sure I was half asleep for the majority of my time on the clock. What made it a lot more simple than the same shift at other locations was the fact that after midnight, I was only allowed to let customers into the store if they were paying for gas with cash at the register. Otherwise, the store was functionally closed for most of my shift, and my job had more to do with cleaning and replacing things to prepare for the morning shift. That was the perk of being right by the interstate exit. I barely ever had to deal with people, and that was great for me because I've always had more than a fair deal of social anxiety. However, it's not like my first real job helped me get over any of it, in all honesty. What happened during my last shift there definitely set me back several years. It started out like any normal shift. Monday nights were always super dead. A few cars came through to get gas in the first hour, but nobody came into the store. I was so bored that I had already started mopping before the store even closed. About halfway through the aisles, I realized it was a few minutes past 12, so I stepped away to go lock the front door and flip the sign from open to closed. Right as I did this, I took another look outside, and that's when I saw the creepiest night shift freak I've ever seen, walking through the pumping station toward the front door. He looked like he was taller than the gas pumps, and just about wider than one too. Disturbingly, he locked eyes with me as he approached and didn't look away. I could see that he didn't have a car, so I was relieved that I wouldn't have to let him inside. I pointed to the closed sign and double checked that the door was locked, then walked back to the mop bucket right before we got face to face. He rattled the door and started knocking on the glass immediately. I turned away and broke eye contact, hoping that if I ignored him for a few minutes, he would just go away. For a moment, I thought it had worked because I couldn't hear him anymore. Unfortunately, by the time I finished mopping the aisles in the bathroom and got up to mop the area in front of the door, he was still there. It startled me the way he was just waiting, crouched down to my eye level with his gigantic hands up against the glass, so he could stare inside with this super intense smile. Open up, I want Slurpee. Sorry, but we're closed. The register is for gas purchases only after 12 o'clock, immediately. That jolly expression drained from his face and he scowled at me before backing off and walking away. The encounter gave me the creeps, but I was able to just shrug it off thinking he was gone. I finished mopping the rest of the store, and after I drained the bucket, I decided to take a 5 or 10 minute break in the back room while the floor dried. When I went back to the register and looked out the front door, I saw the last thing <gasps> I wanted to see. That freakishly tall man was back, and now he was standing outside beside a car by one of the gas pumps. By the time I noticed him, he was already staring at me. I swore under my breath as he started making his way to the door again. Here was the exact sort of interaction that I dreaded every single night, and now it was about to happen. Pump number four. Um, how are you paying? Cash. My heart sank as I knew there was no avoiding letting him into the store for any reason other than outright denying him, which I was too nervous to do. He was the sort of person I expected to break down the door if I rubbed him the wrong way. Reluctantly, I walked around the counter and unlocked the door for him. I wanted to put some space between us, so I walked right back around to the register so he'd have to open the door himself. When I was at the register, he was already waiting, looming over me by at least two feet. Um, how much are you putting on pump four? That's when the brute grabbed me by my collar and screamed in my face. Slurpee. I want Slurpee. Give me Slurpee. Then he lifted me up over the counter like I was nothing. For a split second, I was so high in the air that I thought he was going to slam me against the ground and crack my skull open. But I was saved by a lucky shot. While I was flailing in his grasp, I managed to push off by kicking my feet straight to his chest, making him drop me to the floor and stagger back. I took my moment to get away and sprint into the bathroom and locked the door behind me, calling the police immediately. From there, it was a waiting game of being terrified that he'd try to break the lock on the door, something I'm sure he could have done if he wanted to. Luckily, the police were only a few minutes away. By the time they arrived, the brute was gone, and so was everything in the Slurpee machine. But strangely, the car from earlier was still parked outside by the pump. When the cops went over to investigate it, they found an unconscious man slumped over in the driver's seat. 
I was fine. So the ambulance that the dispatcher had called in for me ended up taking that guy to the hospital after he was gone. The cops had me show them the security footage from the night. We saw that giant creep walk up to the car right after it parked and smashed the driver's side window. Then he appeared to have strangled the man inside before stuffing him out of view so he could pose as the owner of the car. The part that gets me though, is despite the fact that this weirdo was the most distinct looking person I've ever seen, he has never been found. How a 7 plus foot tall giant simply disappears, I don't know. One thing I do know is that someone who would go through so much trouble and be so violent over something as minor as a slurpee, is someone I never want to see again. If he ever showed up again, I'd be scared for my life. And that's just not the social anxiety speaking. Needless to say, I can't work at 7-Elevens anymore. This story was inspired by a New York 7-Eleven. It was reported that a bandit would intentionally steal cups of Slurpee nearly every day for a month while taunting employees as he walks out. The culprit was said to be described as a large man in his late 30s to early 40s. The 7-Eleven employees have stated that they tried to catch the man but were unable to since he committed the thefts during the store's busiest hours. Police have yet to find the man. When I was in my last year of elementary school, that's when Snapchat started becoming super popular. Pretty much everyone had a Snapchat and was using it all the time. The teachers always acted horrified by us being on our phones so much, but we all thought it was just a cool, fun new thing to play with and didn't see the harm in it. I remember when I used to use Snapchat back and forth with this guy named Richard. He was one of those random people that could just pop up on the app and add you as a friend. These days, everybody knows to be cautious with adding people you don't know, unless you really just care that much about seeming more popular to everyone else. But back then it was different. It didn't feel dangerous to simply text people and maybe trade photos even if you'd never met them in person before. Plus it was really cool that it was a possible way to make new friends that you didn't go to school with. Everybody was randomly adding people and accepting random requests to just have something to do. So, even though I never knew a Richard, I added him back and we started to talk. After a few weeks it seemed like I might have really made a new friend, or at least an online friend, like the modern day equivalent of a pen pal. We had a streak of selfies and we would also send each other whatever other random snaps we took that day. Based on the pictures he sent me and the stuff he posted on his story, I was pretty much certain that he was real and not a catfish. Sometimes, I'd even ask him out of the blue to send me some specific pose in his next selfie, like a peace sign with one eye open, and he would do it, which was how I knew he wasn't just using someone else's pictures. Also, Richard was kind of cute to me and after talking for a little while, we learned that we were about the same age and lived in the same area, sort of. For a while, there was never any talk about meeting in person, and every day that went by he didn't ask me to come over made me that much more sure he wasn't creepy. Of course, he did ask eventually, and I was almost willing to do it, but even at that age I knew that it would be really stupid to do. Instead, I did something else that was really stupid, and I asked Richard if he'd rather come to my house, since I wasn't comfortable going to the house of somebody that was technically a stranger. He said that was fine with him, and I gave him my address. But even though we talked about it, we never actually made plans to meet up. We kind of just forgot about it, or at least that's what I thought happened, until one night when I was awoken at 3am because somebody was spamming my phone with Snapchats. I finally got up and looked at the notifications and realized they were all from Richard. Confused, I opened them and saw a series of snaps of the outside of my house. They were captions saying stuff like, Hey, you up? Let's hang out. Or, I'm here. I'm outside right away. I was finally getting that something wasn't right about this, so I didn't respond at first. Instead, I got out of bed and crept up to my window to take a peek outside. My bedroom was on the second floor facing the street, so I could see the whole area and there wasn't a single soul out there except one person. A fully grown man in a hoodie standing outside my house with his white pickup truck parked in my driveway. 
I knew that wasn't the Richard I thought I was talking to. I stepped away from the window so he couldn't see me, and then I told him off with a few nasty snaps. Leave me alone! You're not Richard, you creep! I was so scared of getting in trouble with my parents, thinking they would get mad at me for talking to strangers on the internet, that I tried to handle the situation myself. I hoped that he would get the message and leave, and while I waited for him to go away, I hid in my bed under the covers. Unfortunately, he persisted and sent me another snap. I opened it, and again, it was an image of my house with the caption, I'm not leaving until you come outside. I still wanted to keep my parents from finding out, so I kept snapping him back trying to reject him, telling him to screw off as harshly as I could. He opened my message, but this time didn't reply. A few seconds passed and I thought for a moment that it had done the trick, but when I started hearing noises outside, I got up and went to my window to look out of curiosity, thinking I would be safe from anything up here on the second floor. But right as I pulled back the curtain, I saw that man right in front of my eyes. In a split second, he punched through the window pane and tried to grab me, but I jumped back just in time and ran away, screaming at the top of my lungs until I made it to my parents' room. My parents got up and immediately came to my aid. By the time we got to my room, there was no sight of the man or his truck. There was just a bunch of broken glass all over the floor and a ladder sitting outside my window. I still can't believe how desperate he must have been to go through the trouble of bringing a ladder and leaning it up against the side of my house just to have a chance to get at me. But for a while, I could never figure out how he was able to fool me with the pictures of that kid that seemed so legit until the police finally finished their investigation on my report and were able to track him down and arrest him. It turns out that the Richard I thought I was talking to was that man's son. He had been coercing his son to pose for multiple pictures and videos just so he could use them to put up a front and lure people like myself into thinking he was one of us and not that nasty old creep he actually is. This story was inspired by a man who would intentionally pose as a teenage boy on Snapchat to prey on the gullible, vulnerable victims he tried to lure in. The number of victims was said to be around 31 individuals in total. He has since been arrested and charged accordingly. <laughs> This is a story that I heard from a friend of a friend of mine that's become something of an urban legend. It happened to a guy who I'll call George. I'll do my best to retell the original tale exactly the way I heard it the first time, since it's all mutated into something else since then. I used to go for a lot of walks at night, since I didn't have a balcony or a yard at my condo. I was more comfortable walking during the night since there was less people around. But after what happened, I don't think I'll ever feel that way again. It started a few years ago on St. Patrick's Day when I was on my usual walk in the middle of the night. I wasn't aware of what the occasion was at the time, so I wasn't wearing any green. I never cared about that stupid rule anyway. It wasn't like I was going to a party. The park that I walked to was empty and peaceful that night. Well, until I saw somebody a few meters down the path from me. He was staggering, so I assumed he was some drunk. I was really hoping we'd walk past each other. However, when he got closer and I got a better look at him, I saw he was covered in leaves and blood. As soon as he noticed I was there, he started to hurry towards me a bit, but he still wasn't moving steadily. In my head, I was thinking he was delirious enough that I could do what I usually do with messed up people. Just flat out ignore them and keep moving. I kept walking, trying to slip past him at the last second. But then, he lunged out of nowhere and grabbed me and started screaming in my face. Run man, go! Go! You gotta get out of here! What are you talking about, dude? You're crazy! No, no I'm not. They're crazy. And they're gonna get you if you don't get the hell away from here and go home! Listen to me, man. You gotta believe me! Whatever, man. Just get off me! I pushed him away and the man stumbled backwards. All of a sudden, it was like he heard something. Jerked his head around to look over his shoulder, then just ran away. He was still stumbling like a drunk, but in that moment, he was rushing like his life depended on it. I stood there for a few seconds, stunned. But I also kept looking in the direction where he'd snapped a glance so nervously before running away. I didn't see anybody or anything there though. I was a little shaken up by the encounter, so after giving that guy a minute head start, I turned around and went home. I figured he was just some unfortunate homeless man that was looking for trouble. I hadn't heard anything about it in the news or from anybody I knew, so after long enough I just tricked myself into believing he was crazy. Fast forward a year later and I was in the same situation, walking through that same park around the same time of night and it was just like the last time. I was totally alone. 
until I wasn't. Just like before, I saw a man come around the bend of the path ahead of me, also covered in leaves and bleeding. But this time, he was sprinting, running away at top speed. But somehow, the leaves were sticking in. Barely a couple seconds after I saw him, he was already blowing past me yelling, RUN! Then he was gone. I stopped in my tracks for a second, debating whether that was even real or not. I thought about turning around and going home again. But then, for some reason, out of pride or spite, I decided to keep going. I walked on for a little while and didn't see anything at first. I almost started to get comfortable enough to laugh. But just before I did, I heard someone else laugh. No, it was singing. It was happy and cheerful, but creepy at the same time. I got up to the top of a small hill, and from there I could see a large portion of the park. That's when I saw him. The person who was singing was a man dressed as a hideous leprechaun. He was dancing in circles around a big pile of leaves. In an instant, I was on edge again. But I couldn't understand why I should be afraid of some guy dressed as a leprechaun. Plus, he seemed really focused on his dance around the pile, so it seemed like it would be easy to walk around him without him noticing. I shouldn't have thought that, though. I should have just gone home, but I didn't. Instead, I walked down the hill a little faster than I was going before. I got near him and he didn't stop dancing, so I thought the coast was clear. I powered through and was just about to pass the pile when he jumped out in front of me. <gasps> you there! Why aren't you wearing any green? Excuse me? Don't you know what day it is? It's St. Patty's Day today, and you're not wearing any green at all. Do you want to get pinched? I, uh, no. I don't really follow that rule, I guess. You don't follow the rule? Why not? I didn't know it was that serious, dude. Ridiculous. Well, enough is enough. You won't get away with that lackadaisical attitude any longer, you little traitor! Right then, he reached out to grab me, but I managed to jump back and start running away. That maniac was fast, though. He caught up to me and tackled me to the ground. You're gonna learn to wear green once I make you wear it! Get off me! Leave me alone or I'm calling the cops! I tried to fight back, but he was much stronger than I expected. Before I knew it, he was pulling fistfuls of leaves out of his pockets and throwing them on me, then using a stapler to stab them into my skin. Pinch, pinch, pinch. <laughs> ah! Because of my dumb decisions, I learned that those men I saw in the park weren't crazy after all. They were actually the other victims of that freak. After I filed a police report regarding the crazy leprechaun, he was never seen at that park again. All I know is that that man was severely ill in the head. I can only imagine him relocating to some other park and attacking more innocent civilians on the next St. Patrick's Day. When Snapchat was hitting a new wave of popularity back in 2017, I was just one of the guys who hopped on the trend at first, but I ended up using it a lot. It was the way that everyone seemed to be connecting with each other at the time. I was able to keep in touch with friends I didn't usually get to see. Sometimes I met new people on there, and I could find out what was going on around town on any particular night, just by looking at the stories people posted, which was a great tool to have when you live in a small town like Carrollton, Georgia. But honestly, 90% of the times I opened the app was just to snap my girlfriend. We were both very busy with our lives but wanted to stay as close as we could, so we would snap each other basically all the time. It did more than save the relationship though. I can all but say without a doubt that it saved a life. Years later, I still think about how crazy this was, and how it all started out from a very mundane set of circumstances. I was at home, working on a kinesiology case study when I got a snapchat from my girlfriend. It was just a car selfie with no caption, but that was what most of our snaps back and forth were, just so we could see each other's faces I guess. I took a quick selfie on my own and sent it back, then tried to go back to see what I was working on. But within about 30 seconds, I got another one from her. This time, she was in a line to check out at the grocery store, taking a selfie over her shoulder at the people in line behind her. There still wasn't a caption, so I was a little confused as to why she showed me the random strangers that were just going shopping. So I sent back a confused selfie with the caption asking what she was saying. 
The next snap was of her walking through the parking lot to her car, but this time she said she was on her way to see me. I smiled and looked over at the picture of her for a few seconds before it expired, but then at the last second, I noticed something disturbing in the background. There was a creepy man walking behind her, clearly checking her out. I immediately snapped her back telling her to call me right away, but despite us going back and forth for a few minutes, there was all of a sudden no reply. I then tried calling her, which I guess I should have done in the first place, but she didn't pick up. She also hadn't opened my message yet, so I assumed she was talking to a friend or too busy driving to use her phone. I knew she was on her way to my place, so I decided to forget about it and try to get some work done before she arrived. At that point, I ended up getting a little too focused on what I was doing because before I knew it, over half an hour had gone by. And then out of nowhere, I had finally gotten a notification from my girlfriend, except she hadn't really replied to me. It was her sharing her snap map location with me, but the odd thing about it was that she was nowhere near my house. She was almost in Atlanta, which was at least a 45 minute drive from Carrollton. I was very confused at this point, and I had a bad feeling about it, so I replied right away, urgently asking her why she was 50 miles away in Atlanta. There was a full minute of no reply in which my anxiety started to fester. She finally replied with a snapchat. I opened it up, unfeeling one of the most disturbing, <gasps> blood-curdling pictures I had ever seen in my life. It was a selfie of my girlfriend crying, with the caption of the most gut-wrenching single word I have ever read saying, kidnapped. That's when I began to lose my mind. I couldn't register what was going on or what logical thing to do next, as my stupid brain didn't think to just call the cops immediately. Instead, I tried to keep the communication going with her over Snapchat. I begged her to tell me that she was joking, but then the next picture made my heart sink even further. She had the camera pointed to the side, showing her in the passenger seat of her own car, with that same creep from before in the driver's seat. And the caption, I could almost hear her voice saying it from the look of fear in her eyes. It read, Don't let me die. I paced around my room in a panic, racking my brain, trying to figure out what to do. I said I was going to get help and told her to keep opening Snapchat whenever it was safe for her to do so. That way her location would keep updating. Then at last, I called the cops and told them exactly what was happening. They took it seriously, notifying all the Atlanta police departments about the kidnapping in progress. And within a few minutes there were cops from Carrollton at my door to coordinate my information about her location with the officers that were in the right area to find her. The police ended up tracking them down to an empty parking lot behind an abandoned church in the greater Atlanta area. My girlfriend says that the way the cops swarmed in on them all at once was both awe-inspiring, but almost as scary as getting kidnapped to begin with. The man who kidnapped her was taken into custody, and thankfully denied bail until he was eventually convicted and thrown in prison to rot for a couple decades. Unfortunately, that hasn't been enough to help my girlfriend from being traumatized about it ever since, and I don't blame her one bit. I've never stopped beating myself up for not going about it better either. I always think of ways in which I could have maybe stopped it from happening in the first place, or at the very least how I could have lessened the amount of time she had to be trapped with that psycho. Of course, we are both very glad that the snap map feature exists. If it weren't for that easily accessible way to see and send the phone's GPS location, things probably would have become the worst case scenario. This story was inspired by a case that happened on September 4th of 2017. The image below is the victim in question. The animation pretty much sums up the tragic ordeal. If it hadn't been for the snap map feature, things could have turned left real quick. Here's a mugshot of the culprit in question. Police have since released surveillance footage of the kidnapping in the parking lot. Here's what it looked like. This happened a few years ago when I used to work at the pharmacy section at a local convenience store during the night shift. 
I didn't do much as business wasn't so busy during these hours. It was literally just me and my colleague Sean who worked the cash register by the front of the store. I worked at the back and would assist customers if they needed help finding their prescriptions. Everything was mundane until one night as I was working. I saw an old woman approaching me from the aisle in the front of the store. Her eyes locked on to mine but in a creepy way. I raised my hand to wave and forced a smile to greet her, but she didn't say anything. Instead, she reciprocated my kind gesture with a grin, her mouth wide open as she stared at me intently. Awkward and spooked out, I decided to take another step forward and offer her my assistance since she was still a customer, and I had no intention of offending her. Hello ma'am, how may I help you? She said nothing. She would simply back up with her walker, standing stiffly from a distance in an aisle as she looked at me. If her stare and sinister grin weren't scary enough, the whole place was almost empty at this late hour, making the atmosphere even more unsettling. Unfortunately, there weren't any loitering prohibitions at the store back then, so I was stuck looking back at the woman, unable to kick her out. As I grew impatient, I felt the need to raise my voice saying, Excuse me, if there's anything you need, you can tell me. Can I help you with anything? Again, there was no reply. Hello? Do you hear anything I am saying? She tilted her head to the side as she stared and smiled, creeping <gasps> me out a lot more than she already had at the beginning. Minutes turned to hours as we fixated on each other, but not in a pleasant way, at least for me. Since she wasn't doing any real harm, I managed to go about my business. However, occasionally, I'd glance at her, ensuring she wasn't stealing anything or up to no good. Then, the night ended there. The woman eventually left, and it was time to close the store. I heaved a hefty sigh, wondering if the woman was mentally ill or suffering from dementia. Either way, I immediately discarded the thought, hoping to never encounter someone like that again. However, the following night, the inevitable would occur. The old lady returned, engaging in another staring contest that made me uncomfortable for the rest of the night. What the heck is your problem? I hollered, unable to help myself. Then, moments later, the old lady began to do this weird hip roll as she she smiled at me. I was convinced she was nuts, like she was some patient who escaped an asylum. Confused and afraid, I yelled, Stop it! You're harassing me! I'm going to call the cops if you don't stop doing that! Then, without warning, I saw the most bizarre thing happen. The woman started urinating as golden liquid came spewing out of her dress and onto the floor. I stood there in utter shock as the puddle grew larger and larger. That's when I decided to take out my cell phone and take a picture of the lady. Then, out of nowhere, the woman threw her walker away and started lunging at me. She jumped over the counter and tried to grab a hold of my neck. That's when I raised my arms to protect myself and restrain her simultaneously. Leave me alone or I'm calling the cops! Somebody help me! Moments later, I could hear my co-worker Sean dashing across the aisle. Sean then started pulling the crazed woman away from me. He tried to reason with her but the strange woman wouldn't stop attacking me. After a minute of sheer terror, Sean was able to yank the woman completely off of me. She then ran out of the store, leaving her walker behind in the aisle as she faked her disability the whole time. Afraid she'd return, we locked the doors and immediately called the cops to give a police report. About 15 minutes later, the police arrive. I answered all of their questions and even gave them a copy of the CCTV footage. However, even after explaining the details, little has happened since. I would call back for months, but the cops never got a credible lead. In the end, they wanted to convince me that it was just another homeless woman whose name hadn't been registered. Fortunately, in the days that followed, the old woman didn't return. I was finally able to focus on my job, eventually forgetting her. A few months later, I went to a family dinner at my parents' place for the holidays. While exchanging stories at the table, I brought up the occurrence and even showed the image of the woman I took from my cell phone. As they gazed at the photo, my parents shrieked, disgusted by what they saw. Their bodies trembled as if they knew who this person was. Confused and baffled, I was compelled to ask them about the bizarre lady. 
What's the matter? It's like you guys saw an actual ghost. Do you know this woman? That's when my parents identified the woman in the photo as a nanny that used to babysit me as a child. And since I was too young to remember, I had no recollection of her. I then began to prod my parents into telling me more. They didn't give me the precise details. However, they did mention how they had to call the cops on her because of something she did to me. But what I found truly terrifying was how she never left my side. All this time, working the night shift unaware of who she was or why she was watching me just gives me the creeps. All I know is that she was mentally ill. It all makes sense why she wouldn't stop looking at me when she was at the store that night. I was driving through town to visit some close family when I suddenly needed to pee. And so, I made a pit stop and pulled over at the nearest gas station which happened to be a 7-Eleven along the way. I've made that trip a thousand times so the people who work there know me by now. But on this particular day, I was caught off guard by the atmosphere I walked into. The clerk didn't even greet me or say anything to me. He was frozen stiff and just stared at me with this deadly serious look in his eyes. It stopped me in my tracks. I looked around in confusion and noticed that the lights were particularly dim too. Like the store was closed, but there were a couple of other customers inside still. One was in the chips aisle with his hands in his pockets and his eyes glued to the ground, and the other one was by the coolers, leaned over with his forehead resting against the glass. But neither of them looked like they intended to grab anything anytime soon. It was so strange. I remembered that I still had to pee, and I could figure out what was going wrong with everyone else after I took care of myself. I made my way to the back of the store and toward the restroom, avoiding the person by the coolers. I was just about to walk up to the door and get my relief when out of the corner of my eye i saw another man crouching down behind the shelf right next to me i didn't have time to react before he sprang out and stopped me he pulled up his shirt and revealed a gun tucked into his waistband then he said don't move lady and don't say nothing either i nodded at this threat of course i wasn't going to say anything i was just then realizing why all the people in the store were acting so gaunt and petrified I'd walked straight into a hostage situation. I could feel my soul leaving my body as the man said. Now go back to the front door and don't take your eyes off the hot food. You hear me? I nodded once more and turned my head slowly to shuffle my way to the counter. As I got to where I was supposed to be, I traded a moment's glance with the clerk. We knew each other sort of, and it was like he was trying to tell me he was sorry, but I felt like a moron for not picking up on what was going on sooner and getting out of there while I could. Instead, I became another hostage in this store full of mannequins, forced to stare at those revolving metal trays with the spinning hot dogs under those obnoxious radiator lamps, just watching them go around and around endlessly. All the while, the robber was rifling through everything in the store right behind me. My heart hadn't pounded like that in years. The there was so much adrenaline in my veins, and as I couldn't even move, it was all turning into a panic. I had just come into the store to use the bathroom, and now I had to go even worse than before. I started to worry if I wouldn't be able to make it. As the seconds dragged on, my judgment became more and more clouded by fear. It seemed like he was never going to finish what he was doing and let us be. Finally, in a split-second decision, I made a run for it. I ran to the door and got right up to it, almost home free before I heard a loud gunshot right behind me. I froze, knowing that he was right behind me and that I probably pissed him off. He grabbed me at the base of the neck and whispered in my ear saying, you're really stupid for an old lady. You know that? You must be senile or something. Well, since you didn't get it the first time, I'll tell you again. If you try me, the next bullet's gonna go through you. Got it? I nodded silently. I was absolutely petrified. It seemed like if I even flinched, it would be the end. But then, the dire situation took another turn as we saw a legion of cops pulling into the parking lot and surrounding the store. Damn it, this is all your fault for wasting my time, you geezer. I'm sorry. Shut I up, let me think, you old hag. He pressed the barrel of the gun into my side as he glared outside and surveyed the scene from over my shoulder. I knew there was no way that this situation ended without somebody getting hurt, and I was directly in the crossfire. Suspect, we have the area surrounded. All exits are blocked. Disarm yourself and exit the building with your hands in the air. Shut up. 
All right, listen to me. Here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna walk out of this store and I'm gonna get in my car. Those pigs out there are gonna let me walk away from this because you're coming with me. Got that? I nodded and then he pushed me forward. I slowly fumbled my way out of the door and as soon as we were outside, the cops started screaming at him with their guns drawn. Let her go and get on the ground, now. The man didn't even heed them at all. He kept pushing me along toward one of the cars that was parked in front of the store. The one I assume was his. I didn't have any other choice but to go along with it. But even then I knew that this was all about to get out of hand no matter what I did. I was positive that I was about to wind up dead. When out of nowhere, somebody ripped the gun out of the robber's hand and tore him off of me. I immediately ran away. Looking back to see that it was the clerk who'd come out of the store and taken the thief by surprise. That's when the pandemonium ensued, as the two of them wrestled over the gun while the police swarmed in a mass of screaming, shouting angry bodies. Eventually, everything was untangled and the low-life thief was dragged away in handcuffs. Then, a couple of the cops asked to take my statement at the scene, but I said, No, take me to the nearest precinct. I have to pee. And that was true. Aside from the toilet at the police station, I've never been able to use a public restroom ever since. This story was inspired by a hostage situation that went down at a Denver 7-Eleven. A woman was held hostage, alongside two other patrons in the store. After hours of negotiation, the police were able to handle the situation accordingly, leaving no injured hostages except for the suspect himself. The suspect was later taken to the hospital and eventually died of his wounds. ago on St. Patrick's Day. While I was hanging out at a college party to celebrate this event, I drove with my friend to the designated venue, which was hosted by a male student in the program who owned a huge house near the campus. He was the type who usually threw parties like this during the holidays. He charged everyone around 10 bucks at the door and told them to show up in green that night. Expectedly, the house was packed with all sorts of people. I toned down a bit, ensuring I didn't have too much to drink since I was also the driver. But after hours of mingling with acquaintances and unfamiliar faces, I began to search for my friend who had came with me to this party. But as my eyes wandered across the area, I soon noticed she wasn't anywhere to be found. I didn't think I should worry because she was probably just somewhere in the crowd, enjoying some music and hard drinks. So eventually, I ended up chilling by myself in the kitchen. Then, moments later, I noticed a random guy from a distance who began hitting on multiple girls at the party. He was like a predator on the prowl, and I admit I was creeped out. He looked really old and weird like he didn't belong at the party, let alone the school. I couldn't fathom how he managed to convince other students that he was around our age. He said a lot of bizarre stuff, constantly hitting on every girl and offering them shots of vodka every chance he got. Most of them seemed friendly toward him, and although I was curious, I didn't think to inquire about him. Then, when he caught me observing him, I instantly looked away as he attempted to do the same thing for me. He tried to hit on me, offering me a shot from a bottle of Grey Goose vodka he was holding. Since I wasn't interested in him and couldn't allow myself to drive home drunk, I politely declined the offer. I didn't know if he was tipsy, but he persisted in having me drink the stuff he offered. Come on, how are you gonna have a date if you keep pushing people away? Excuse me? I replied disgusted and offended. You heard me. Stop playing hard to get. His tone started getting a bit more aggressive. He was getting on my nerves to the point that I wanted to holler out loud, even if I would have to make a fool of myself. But I held back. Back, controlling my temper to avoid the unnecessary conflict. In addition, the crowd would come to my aid and call 911 if this creep ever stepped out of line. So, instead, I told him directly in a dry and steady tone. Get a clue. I'm not interested in you. Now piss off! I annoyingly left an empty wine glass on the countertop, intending to walk away when he grabbed me by my shoulder and replied, Let me give you a lift home. Save your Uber money, baby. I didn't like the tone of his voice. He seemed arrogant like he could get his dirty hands on any girl he wanted. Unfortunately for him, I wasn't just any girl, and so I denied his offer again and relocated away from this freak. 
then, a few moments later, I remembered seeing my friend making out with a random guy amidst the crowd, and lo and behold, it was that creep. I was concerned that my friend was having too much to drink that she started making irrational decisions, determined to get her out of this mess. I pushed through the crowd, desperately trying to approach her. That's when I saw the creep pulling my friend's arm and leading her outside the house. I then started following them. When I got to the porch area of the house, I could see the creep trying to lure my friend into the passenger seat of his vehicle. I wasn't sure if he had put a dangerous substance in her drink, but I knew something was off. So, with little time to lose, I did everything I could to close the gap until I managed to reach out for my friend's arm in an attempt to yank her away. Let go of her now! I screamed, but as I struggled to pull her back into the house, the creep doubled his effort to take her inside the car. Somebody help! Hurry! I couldn't stop yelling against the loud music emanating from inside. Unfortunately, the creep was taken aback and decided to let her go, driving off into the night. Meanwhile, I noticed my friend losing her balance until she eventually collapsed. But what was more alarming was how another person collapsed, then another, and then multiple people began to collapse, their bodies dropping everywhere. I was downright terrified, wondering how much alcohol everyone was consuming. I then checked my friend's pulse and realized that her breathing was extremely shallow. So, without a moment to lose, I called for an ambulance, and when it arrived, multiple people were taken on a stretcher as they were carefully transferred to the vehicle. Then, after gathering all the victims, they were immediately taken to the nearest hospital. After hours had passed, it was confirmed that the college students who were brought to the hospital that night, including my friend, had their drinks spiked. Then, it finally dawned on me. The image of the bizarre creep appeared vividly in my head. During the investigation, the police were still unable to identify the suspect's name, address, and other essential details. However, at the moment, they were able to link his heinous crimes to an unidentified male who had been attending multiple college events in the past, similarly spiking drinks in the hopes that he could lure someone away, like how he almost did to my friend. This story was inspired by an incident that happened at a party in Ireland. A woman snapped a photograph of the exact moment the man roofied her friend's drink, as shown in the photo below. As soon as she witnessed what was going on, she alerted her friend by shouting at her not to consume the drink. When the man realized he was caught, he immediately took off and has yet to be caught by police. Unfortunately for the friend, she was taken to a hospital after complaining about not feeling well. She has since recovered and lives to tell the tale. This happened when I was a freshman in college and lived in a tiny two-bedroom house in one of the off-campus neighborhoods with another girl. But in an effort to make friends aside from my roommate, I spent as much time as possible on campus. After classes, I would usually study in the library for a few hours or go to the student gym. Whenever I was at the gym, I would always run into this guy named Justin. I never saw him do any real workouts. At most, he would just walk on the treadmill for a few minutes. It was clear that his intention wasn't to exercise, but to lurk around and bother the girls that were there, me being one of them. He would always come up and talk to me while I was in the middle of a set. I would barely acknowledge him, maybe giving him the courteous nod just so he can leave me alone. That's when Justin took it as a green light to start flirting with me, rudely disregarding my workout. I would try to avoid him, but it was clear he never got the message. Unfortunately, during those early days of college, I was in a vulnerable spot, moving away Away from home and going to school made me feel shy, so I didn't have the guts to tell him to straight up screw off like I wanted to. Eventually over time, we started to form this weird friendship of some sort after he asked me for my snapchat a bunch of times. I caved and gave it to him. From then, we would snap each other occasionally, but obviously he was a lot more active in the conversation than I was. I wanted him to lose interest and leave me alone, but for some reason I felt compelled to consider him a friend since I lacked having any. But this would all come back to bite me when I started randomly running into Justin more often. We never made plans to hang out, but he had the tendency to just pop up wherever I went around campus. I avoided him when I could, but he was often able to corner me into unwanted conversations where he would habitually ask to walk me home. 
I always found some way to decline. There was no way I wanted him to know where I lived. However, by the time I started to realize how creepy Justin was, it was already getting to be too late. One night, at around 2 in the morning, I was woken up by a notification. I would usually sleep through that, but I was having trouble sleeping that night because of all the stress from Justin Loki stalking me, so I rolled over to check it out. To my severe disappointment, it was a Snapchat from Justin. I should have left it on delivered for that night, but in a momentary lapse of thinking I opened it. I was shocked. It was a picture of him standing in the bathroom mirror with nothing but a towel, and he was soliciting me with his caption saying, Send a nude? I was so disgusted that I couldn't stomach replying to it, so I left it on red and went back to sleep. A few minutes later, Justin sent me another Snapchat. At this point, I was curious to see how deep he would dig himself into this hole, and what I saw was somehow more disturbing than the mirror picture. It was a selfie of him with tears running down his face. He was actually crying this time. This was more disturbing coming from an adult. The caption read, Why are you leaving me on red? I felt embarrassed just for thinking we could be friends and I was losing my patience. So despite the fact he'd already crossed several lines, I gave him the grace of texting. Please leave me alone. I sent the message and rolled over to sleep. That's when I heard multiple Snapchat notifications from Justin, but I ignored them for as long as I could. However, the whole situation was causing me to toss and turn, but without ever getting any good rest. Finally, after about an hour, I gave up and checked my phone. The series of snaps I opened in that moment made my blood curdle. The first one was a picture of his feet up on a public bus with a caption saying he was on his way. But what was seemingly just a harmless back and forth interaction became all the more disturbing when I saw his next Snapchat. It was a snap in front of my house saying he was here. I freaked out and sat up in bed. It was clear he already knew where I lived, but it wasn't over yet. That alone was bad, but it was the third snap that made me know I had to get the police involved. It was a picture looking through a gap between a set of doors. A picture of me sleeping in my bed with the caption, You look so beautiful when you're asleep. In a heartbeat, I sprang out of bed and sprinted out of the room. Right as Justin burst from my closet and started chasing after me, he nearly got me, but I was able to get to the bathroom down the hall and lock the door behind me. A second later, he was banging on the door repeatedly. All I could do was threaten to call the cops, but it seemed like he wasn't going to leave until I surrendered myself. I collapsed with my back pressed against the door as I sat on the bathroom floor, wailing under my breath. I actually couldn't call the cops. I ran out of my room room so fast that I left the phone on my bed. Luckily, my roommate just so happened to be in the other room. She had awoken to the chaos and got up to lock her door and call the police for me. About 10 very tense minutes later, the cop showed up. Justin didn't try to run. He folded and let them take him away, sobbing like a big baby the whole time. Afterwards, I had the conversation with my roommate about how he was able to find out where I lived. The very first thing she asked me was if I left my snap map on. I immediately had the biggest face palm moment of my life because that's exactly what it was. The snap map was a new feature back then and I wasn't thinking much about it until that moment. However, I also learned how little the college cared about my safety. When the cops ran Justin's background, they found multiple instances of aggravated stalking, yet somehow he was allowed to just wander around campus all the time. This story was inspired by a real life event where a male suspect would use the snap map feature to locate and trace the movements of a female who he had grown an obsession with. When the female started to realize the more random and frequent bump ins with the male, she knew something was wrong and immediately reached out to law enforcement. The male has since been given a restraining order. The person who submitted the story has attached screenshots of the alleged snapchats.
In 2017, I was still living in Australia as an international exchange student. During most of that time, I also had to work a job at 7-Eleven to pay for my expenses that weren't covered by the exchange program. The only hours I was available to work were the night shift, which was a <gasps> grueling experience. It didn't help that the area was pretty sketchy. The 7-Eleven is where all the homeless people, gangbangers, and streetwalkers flock to late at night, and the high crime rate made everything that much more chaotic. There was usually some kind of bad element loitering in or around the store, which always put me on edge. The second I looked away, somebody would be fighting, stealing, dealing, or sneaking off into the bathroom for 45 minutes doing who knows what. I didn't get paid enough to do anything about it, but it was always anxiety inducing just to be stuck in there to run the register. All that aside, there was only one night working there that was just too much for me to handle. Actually, I still have nightmares about this experience. It was just that frightening. Oddly enough, the night started out as a better night than most, which to me meant there wasn't anything weird or sketchy happening outside and nobody was causing trouble inside. Everything was pretty bearable for about two hours, but then at around 1 a.m., the night took a turn for the worse. A trans woman walked in holding an axe. She gave me the creeps just from the empty look in her eyes, and the fact that she was carrying that axe was all the more unsettling. For a second, she just stood in the front of the door and stared at me. Um, excuse me ma'am, you can't bring that in here. You mean this? Suddenly, she raised the axe into the air then stepped towards the register before dropping it onto the counter. I jumped back instinctively, thinking that I was about to get robbed, but then the woman leaned over and said the most disturbing thing. You know this axe means I can get into your store whenever I want, right? You know why? See that glass right there on your door? This axe could go right through it, like it wasn't even there. So don't tell me what I can and can't bring in here, alright? Because I can get to you whenever I want. I'm sure it could, and I'm sure you could, but... Uh, but what? Huh? What are you gonna say to me? I bit my tongue and held myself back from threatening to call the police for the moment. I was afraid of what her reaction might be. She didn't seem to be alright in the head, and you just can't predict people like that. I... Uh... How can I help you? Help me? What do you mean, help me? Do you think I need help? What? N no, 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 I, I meant, like, is there anything I can get for you from the store? Don't cop an attitude with me, punk! You know what else this axe could cut through with these? Your skull! So shut up! Ma'am, if you threaten me again, I'll have to call the cops. Saying that felt like pulling the pin on a grenade, but it was my only option to deal with her as she was becoming increasingly aggressive and could resort to violence at any moment. Her jaw clenched up and she gave me a death glare, causing me to back away in fear. She chewed on what I said for a very tense few seconds before responding. You're gonna call the cops on me? Why? What did I do wrong? Nothing! You just have a problem with me, don't you? Is it because the way I look? All you imbeciles are all the same! Every one of you! Well, I don't want anything from your crummy store anyway, loser! At last, she took the axe in her hand, backed off, then stormed out of the store. I breathed a sigh of relief that she didn't swing that axe on anyone, but my heart was still racing, and there was a mark on the counter from where she dropped the head of the axe onto it. A few minutes later, a female patron came walking into the store, followed by a male. They shopped around the aisles for a bit before coming up to the register around the same time. I started cashing out the female customer first, but just as I was about done scanning her items, my heart sank as I saw that same woman from earlier walk through the door again, still holding the axe. This time, she looked enraged, far more than before. That's when I saw the male patron engaging with the woman as she stared him down with the axe saying, What are you looking at? What are you doing with that axe? Why do you care? Because you could hurt somebody with that thing. You're right! In a flash, the woman lunged over and lifted the axe to do the unthinkable. <laughs> what the hell is wrong with you? The male patron immediately collapsed, bleeding profusely, having taken the blow for the female patron who tried to run away. But all hell broke loose when that psycho woman chased after her and struck her from behind, dropping her to the ground. 
Finally, the psycho looked back at me. I'll never forget the expression on her face. Half unbridled psychotic rage, half deer in the headlights. I thought she was about to come after me, but something must have spooked her because after a moment, she suddenly sprinted away. I thought both the man and the woman were dead, but they started to make noises. That awful moaning of the gravely injured is something I'll never forget. I called Triple O and tried to do what I could for them before the ambulance arrived. By that time, it was out of my hands. I was a mess, totally distraught. I thought neither of them would make it, but miraculously, they both survived. It was alleged that while the psycho was running away, she started chasing multiple random pedestrians on the street, trying to take a swing at them. Luckily, she didn't injure anyone else further. I still don't know why she attacked those other people and not me, but I try not to wonder too much. Of course, everything was on camera. She was caught and put in prison, but that does nothing to erase the memory. This story was inspired by a viral incident that occurred at a Sydney 7-Eleven that shocked the nation. Here is the footage prior to the random attack. The woman has been sent sentenced to nine years behind bars. After a follow-up, it has been said that her jail term will be increased by five years. What makes this case more disturbing was how the woman alleges that she did not remember anything. It happened a couple years ago when I was 24. I used to work as a janitor on the upper floors of a skyscraper where I took the night shifts, allured by the promise of better pay. I was in charge of everything relevant to maintenance and cleaning, which meant I had to monitor every floor, cubicle, and washroom. Even the cafeteria was under my responsibility. I admit that when it came to daring games and horror films, it was easy for me to get cold feet, and if it weren't for the compensation, I wouldn't have gotten this job in the first place place. It was usually creepy at night since there weren't security personnel at the time, but to make matters worse, there were moments when I felt like I wasn't alone. I'd heard creaks from doors that I swore I had locked, and other occasional noises like tables and chairs moving from time to time. I never got used to it. I was always scared, telling myself that I was only imagining things and that the effects of utter silence were just as deafening as the cars honking on the streets. Of course, I understand the stark contrast between the two scenarios. But either way, I couldn't find peace. So, to maintain my sanity, I tried to be reasonable, assuming that all these noises came from the infrastructure, since it had been erected several years ago and it was now decaying. Then, one night, while I was vacuuming on the 13th floor, I heard a noise from the hallway. I tried to shug it off as I focused on my work, but when I turned off the vacuum, I heard the same noise. It was something like someone moaning in the dark, and from the range of its voice, I could only assume it was a male. So, even though I should veer away from the sound, I made a shocking decision to uncover the source, only to find out it was coming from the woman's washroom. When I was in front of the door, the sound was much louder than before. For a moment, I thought about checking inside to prove that I was being silly, but my instincts were telling me to run back to the cubicle area where I should just wait it out. The lights in the room were on. I was still convinced it was all in my head, so I didn't think anything would go wrong. But since I wanted to make sure my life wasn't in any real danger, I sat in one of the cubicle chairs and texted my boss to ask him if he had assigned anyone else besides me to monitor the building. He then sent me an emoji indicating he was confused, followed by another response, which gave me the chills. First, he told me there wasn't anybody else but me. Then, he asked me to check the CCTV cameras to make sure it was nothing. I nodded, thinking it would be safer to lock myself in the control room until morning. So, I stood up gradually and intended to leave the area. But before I could get the hell out of there, I heard someone open the washroom door, sprinting toward the room I was in. I immediately ran and hid in one of the cubicles and remained crouched down for God knows how long. I didn't move a muscle, realizing that the footsteps had stopped by the room I was in. Then, suddenly, the lights went out, putting me in total darkness. I wanted to scream out loud, but I knew it would only give away my position. So, I held back, constantly forcing myself to calm down and find another way out. Moments later, I heard the same moaning sound. 
I could hear its voice wandering across the vast area of the cubicles. I was paralyzed, unable to move even if I wanted to. Aside from the low, sinister moans, everything else was silent. I held my breath for as long as I could, afraid that whoever the trespasser was would be able to identify me. Then, as I glanced above the cubicle wall, my worst fear was realized. A pair of round, maniacal eyes peered over me. That's when I saw the face of a creepy man smiling at me as he looked me dead in the eyes. And then he made that awful sound I've been hearing all night. Mm -hmm. I then ran for my life as the menace lunged at me, trying to grab my arm. But before he could get a hold of me, I ran towards the staircase and sprinted to the floors below. Then, as I scampered, I heard a loud slam followed by quick footsteps desperately trying to catch up to me. I increased my pace as I descended the flight of steps. I was able to successfully storm out of the building. Then, once I was out, I ran across the street and called my boss to alert him of what was going on. He told me the cops were on their way, and so, I waited, crouching next to a massive trash bin where every sound made me anxious. When the police finally arrived, they thoroughly searched the building while I was escorted to one of their cars for safety. Moments later, the cops came out with someone in handcuffs. When I asked the police about the guy, I soon discovered that he was an ex-employee of the firm who was fired for sexual harassment. There were countless reports involving him and other female employees which was resulted in his termination. According to the previous documents, all these women claimed to have been assaulted by the man in the woman's washroom. However, even when the situation went back to normal and I could work again, knowing that this man thought of me as his next girlfriend sent chills down my spine. Since then, my boss has hired security to work alongside my night shifts. I don't know what that man has done to me psychologically, but every time I pass the woman's washroom, I could swear I still hear his moans. <coughs> It was almost 50 years ago the last time I hitchhiked. I was still a young woman then, so not exactly as wise as I am now. But things were also much different in the 70s. It was the summer of 1974 to be exact. I just had it out with my fiance early one evening and stormed out of his house. The argument was pretty heated, so I didn't want to ask him for a ride back to where I was staying. Instead, I walked down the road as far as I could until my legs began to cramp. It was getting late, so I decided to stick my thumb out to the cars that passed by. Within a few tries, I got somebody in a tan Volkswagen to pull over. When he rolled his window down, I saw a man more handsome than I thought he'd be. It honestly caught me off guard. Hey, need a ride? Um, I... Come inside. It's getting cold out here. I'm only going about three miles. Is that alright? That's just fine. My name is Ted. Nice to meet you, Ted. I'm Samantha. Hop in. I'll take you wherever you need to go. I was admittedly feeling a little nervous, but the man was rather good looking, so I decided to get in. I told him where my parents' house was and he started heading in that general direction. It wasn't long before he grabbed a beer from the case in the back and offered me one. He hadn't asked me my age, but I wasn't going to bring that up, so I accepted the offer and we both started hammering them back. But that's when the night started to get a little off course. Why don't we go for a ride? Uh, okay. It all seems stupid now, of course, but things were much different in the 70s. I was a little worried, but people weren't as paranoid about each other as they are now. In fact, the idea of getting revenge on my fiancé with an attractive guy seemed too good to be true. By the time we crossed the river into the next state over, I knew it was going to take a lot longer than I originally planned to get home. However, the more time I spent talking with that man, the more comfortable I got with following his lead. By the time the drinks were done, we must have been driving for about 30 minutes. I had no idea where we were going. All I vaguely remember was that we'd crossed into Kentucky which was a little ways from home. That's when Ted abruptly pulled into a completely random spot that looked like a construction zone of a future neighborhood. I then asked him, What are we doing in here? Are we allowed to do this? No, but isn't it fun to go where you're not supposed to be? Uh, I guess it is. He drove around the winding streets for a few minutes until we were somewhere in the back of the whole real estate project. 
Then he stopped at one of the unfurnished houses and got out. I wasn't sure about going inside a building that was only half built, but I was feeling quite adventurous, so I kept following him. We snuck inside and found a private spot. Then Bill pulled me in close and kissed me. I fell right into it. I thought it was so nice and was anticipating something like this to happen ever since I knew he was giving me more than a ride home. I was up for it just to get back at my fiance anyway. But then all of a sudden, both of his hands were suddenly wrapping around my throat, squeezing tightly. All I remember seeing was the most cold-hearted eyes I can ever imagine. I couldn't comprehend if he was just getting into it or if he was trying to kill me. But then, all of a sudden, we heard male voices approaching nearby. <gasps> Immediately, Ted got spooked and dropped his hands. And from that point on, he behaved very differently like he'd snapped out of a trance. I thought the voices just sounded like construction workers coming back from a break. But Ted acted as though them simply being there was like getting caught by the police. He then said, let's get out of here, now. What? We just got here. I said we have to go. Now get back in the car. He rushed me back inside his car then sped off. In the moment, I barely knew what was going on. I was confused as to why we had gone all the way out there to make out or do whatever we were going to do. Just stop all of the sudden right at the start of things and go all the way back. Then he was mean to me after that, not charming and hypnotic anymore, which made me think I had done something wrong. The whole drive back was made in silence. It gave me plenty of time to think about the situation. He definitely knew where he was going the whole time, and it was clear his intention was never just to drop me off at home. I was sure that he had scoped out that remote construction site just before he picked me up. But then there was the way he grabbed my throat like that. By the time we got back into town, I was realizing I should probably be glad things took the turn they did. I was definitely discouraged from ever hitchhiking again. When he finally dropped me off near my parents' house, he was proving to be as cold-hearted as he looked. Goodbye. Thanks for the ride. He completely ignored my goodbye and peeled off into the night. I never saw him again, and I was too embarrassed by the whole thing to tell anyone for a long time. I might have never mentioned it to anyone at all if it weren't for what I found out many years later. I was reading about a serial killer, and as I read it, I started to piece things together. There were an awful lot of similarities between what the book described and what I saw that night in 1974. The handsome man, the kind of car he drove, the rides for young girls in the middle of the night that became something more. And when I pictured his face, it was undeniable. I had no idea how close I'd come to death that night because the man I was with was undoubtedly Ted Bundy. This story was inspired by a real life case involving a female named Sherry. The animation pretty much sums up what went down in the summer of 1974. Sherry has since lived to tell about her close call with the infamous Ted Bundy. I used to work as a bank teller for a high-end bank. It was usually slow during the weekdays for most of the time. We had customers popping in and out of the bank only to withdraw money from the ATMs. Occasionally, people would approach the front desk with queries and concerns. However, it was St. Patrick's Day, so I was assigned to work with one other colleague of mine. We were both stuck there for several grueling hours. The policies in this job were strict, so even if we wanted to, we weren't allowed to sit down, go on the phone, or even make small talk unless it was lunch time. I was coerced by my boss to stand during working hours and wait for customers to approach me. However, after hours of waiting, no one had come. But that was until a customer finally came in and approached me for my assistance. And no, this wasn't your ordinary customer. I was awestruck as I watched a man dressed as a green leprechaun make his way before me, leaving me no other choice to think he was either Irish or simply enjoyed celebrating St. Patrick's Day a little too much. He wore shades over his eyes and wore a large top hat over his head. Then, just when I thought he was odd looking, another sketchy patron entered the bank. This time, he was the complete opposite. It was a normal looking guy wearing a beanie, but he didn't look too enthralled 
wild with the leprechaun's getup. The man then went straight to my colleague by the other side of the counter. I then drew my attention back to the leprechaun, and that's when he asked me typical questions regarding his credit card and how we could rectify the issue. I gave the leprechaun a brief rundown on the whole thing. Then I noticed his eyes wandering around as though he was searching for something across the vast empty space surrounding us. That's when the leprechaun said, Do you celebrate St. Patrick's Day? Yes. I do. I said anxiously. The leprechaun then noisily asks, Is there anyone working besides you two today? I felt a shiver down my spine, thinking it was unusual for him to ask me this query, so I replied, Are you thinking of applying here? However, he didn't respond. Instead, he stared at me as he cracked his knuckles and flexed his shoulders every so often. Then, he persisted in saying, It seems like there's only you and one other colleague here today. I didn't know what to say or do. All I could hope for was that the man would just get whatever he needed done and leave. Since he no longer asked me about his credit card, I decided it was time to end our interaction. But unfortunately, there was something very suspicious about him. He just stood there quiet and then oddly turned his head to face the other patron across the front counter and then noticed the other patron staring back at him. They stared at each other for a solid five seconds, and then turning their heads back to my colleague and I. Something was definitely not right. It was like they knew each other or were possibly acquaintances that me and my colleague were unaware of. That's when I started getting suspicious. I started convincing myself that these guys were up to no good, desperately containing my confusion and discontent. I gradually reached into my back pocket, hoping to get my phone and dial 911 without letting the customer notice. However, everything happened so fast when the customer by my colleague pulled down his beanie into a ski mask while the leprechaun took out a duffel bag and demanded that we hand over all of our money. I screamed and shouted. My mind immediately went blank as my vision began to dim and my audible senses became erroneous. Both the leprechaun and the masked assailant hopped over the counter and began pointing a gun at us. Then, when I glanced over at my colleague, I could see that she was crying incessantly as her body trembled. However, the man in the ski mask threatened to put her out of her misery if she didn't stop wailing. It was evident that these two had conspired to rob this bank, and my colleague and I were unfortunately standing in the wrong place place at the wrong time. So, without another word, we began stuffing their duffel bags with money. My colleague constantly sent me signals from the way she looked at me, as though she were pushing me to help her get out of this mess. However, the robbers didn't like the idea of us communicating, and so they separated us from each other while they made us do their bidding. With guns pointed at us, we only did what we could do to survive. Then, once their bags were full to the brim, they took off with the money and made a run for it, while my colleague curled into a coil. Her body was quivering as I picked up the phone to call the police. Law enforcement immediately responded and got in a wild shootout with the robbers. The whole incident resulted in a fatality that left the leprechaun and his fellow assailant in a stretcher. After following up with this story, it was said that both the robbers died of their injuries. It still shocks me knowing the great lengths people will thrive for when it comes to money. St. Patrick's Day has been nothing but a reminder every year on how me and my colleague got robbed and how we almost had our lives taken away. This story sounds too good to be true, right? Unfortunately, it is true. This story was inspired by a case that happened in Nashville, Tennessee. During St. Patrick's Day in 2010, a man staged a robbery dressed as a leprechaun alongside his friend. Here is the image below of the alleged occurrence. As the assailants fled the scene, they didn't make it very far and unfortunately got the unlucky side of the pot. 